when 21-year-old flour mill employee Alice Matthews said goodbye to her family as she left for an evening out with her co-workers on March 23, 1912. They had no idea it would be the last time they would see her alive. The next morning her body was found just yards away from safety and the words so close to home became the disbelieving, sorrowful refrain of her grieving relatives and friends echoed by the newspapers. Please stay tuned to hear Alice's story. This show contains descriptions of violent crimes and may not be suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to another episode of Prasher's Murder Map. This case is about a young woman whose life was cut cruelly short, just yards away from the home she lived in with her father, stepmother and four siblings. Alice Matthews had a happy home life and a good job, was liked by everyone and was a very low risk victim. Google Maps shows that she lived in a pretty tree lined avenue not somewhere you would be worried about walking alone. So how was it possible that she was murdered in her own street, that her screams were heard by neighbours, and that someone even confessed to the crime more than once, yet nobody was ever taken to trial, and to this day, there has never been justice. Little documentation exists on this case, so everything we have comes from newspapers. Eric Rivenus, host of The Most Notorious, and where Blood Runs Cold podcasts is the first person, as far as I'm aware, to bring this case out of the dusty archives and into the light. I've done my own research using the online Minnesota Historical Society archives, and I found it very compelling. I especially enjoyed the old-fashioned way people used to write back then, and seeing product advertisements like a set of whalebone teeth for just $4, guaranteed never to fall out, even when laughing or eating corn on the cob. Anyway, it was Eric Rivenus's episode which inspired me to investigate this case for myself, so please do check out his show. I'm also bringing you two other great podcast recommendations today. Charlie and Eileen, who host Crime Labs, and Melanie, who hosts Mask of Sanity. I'll be playing their promos at the end, so please listen out for those. Let's get started on the case. On the night of March the 23rd, 1912, Mrs Thomas and her husband were asleep in their home at 3541 20th Avenue, Minneapolis, when they were startled awake by a scream. What's that? Sounds like somebody screaming. I'm sure I heard somebody cry out. Please let me go. Please let me go. Maybe it was some neighborhood kids. Mrs Larson and her teenage son Verna at 3518 20th Avenue, also heard shouts. They went outside to see what was going on and heard the same words that Mrs Thomas did, please let me go, although the papers reported that one person had heard, please let me go, and I promise not to tell. The Larsons didn't have a phone, so Verna ran to the home of their neighbour Mrs Tibbetts to use hers to call the police. Mrs Tibbetts went outside, and saw what looked like a body on the ground, although she thought it could have been somebody drunk. She later told the papers about her experience that night. My husband was sick in bed, so my daughter and I went out, toward the spot from which the scream was supposed to have come. We saw a form half rise from the shadow of the bank which rises from the sidewalk. We were afraid it was someone waiting to spring upon us, so we retreated to the house. My daughter telephoned at 11.55 p.m. and told them there'd been a woman's scream and that we'd seen someone at 20th Avenue and 35th Street. He said they would send a motorcycle man. Shortly after, we saw a man on a bicycle at 35th Street, but as he did not wear a uniform, we were afraid to call him. He soon went away. The next time I called the Minnehaha station was about 12.30 a.m. We could still hear someone moving in that black space where the body lay. Every time we opened the door, we could hear the sound. I mentioned the woman's scream again, 
This time, I not only gave our house number, but the number of the house in front of which the body lay. For an hour we waited, the light in the front room burning brightly, the curtain up, and one of us always at the window. The police said that a man on horseback would be sent, but he didn't come, and at 1.40, we put out the light and went to bed. The next morning, they looked out of the window and were shocked to find that the figure was still lying on the sidewalk. Mrs. Tibbetts went outside, and as she got closer, she realised with horror that it wasn't a drunk man at all. It was the body of a young woman. Her head was leaning against the base of the bank, and it was obvious there'd been an almighty struggle, with dirt kicked up everywhere. Mrs. Thomas, who had also heard the screams the night before, joined her outside, and together they realised the terrible truth. The dead woman lived nearby at 3547 20th Avenue South. Her name was Alice Matthews and she was just 21 years old. Mrs Tibbetts went to break the dreadful news to the family. Heartbroken Henry Matthews raced out onto the street, struggling to understand how the night before he'd been waving his smiling happy daughter off for an evening out and the next morning he was looking down at her lifeless body. In a grief-stricken state that papers said went far beyond tears, Mr Matthews told reporters that he wanted to face the man who killed his daughter, and was putting his trust in the police to bring the murderer to justice. Sadly, he would find that this trust was misplaced. When Alice's body was examined, it was discovered that her lips were swollen from being hit in the mouth, her throat was scratched and bleeding, her clothes were torn and her nails were broken. She was holding a bent hat pin, having tried to use it as a weapon. Her purse was in her other hand, so the motive couldn't have been robbery. She'd put up a tremendous struggle and her killer would have likely have scratches on him. She'd been sexually assaulted and the cause of death was strangulation. So who was Alice? And what were the events that led up to her tragic death? Alice had four younger siblings, and the closest in age was 19-year-old Jenny. Their mother had died many years before, and their father, Henry, the foreman of a sewer crew, had remarried, and they all had a good relationship with their stepmother. It was a happy home. Alice had been working at the Pillsbury flour mill for three years, packing flour into bags to be sold in stores. Her female co-workers had become friends, and she was liked by everyone, with a reputation as hard-working and honest. She had never had a boyfriend, and didn't hang around with bad crowds. On Saturday, March the 23rd, Alice and her sister Jenny both went out for the evening, Alice to see a show and have dinner with some of her colleagues from the mill, and Jenny to a party with friends. Jenny was to come home that night, but Alice was to stay with friend Ida Belfi and planned to return in the morning. Alice and Ida met another friend, Minnie Morgan, at 8pm and they saw a show at the Isis Theatre on 6th Street. Afterwards, they ate at a Chinese restaurant, despite Alice's father warning her against going to what were popularly known as chop suey houses. I'm not sure why he didn't want her to go there, as they were not a new phenomenon, with some evidence that the earliest Chinese restaurant was opened in the late 1840s in San Francisco, catering for gold miners. I've seen references to the fact that both theatres and Chinese restaurants were for some reason seen as hotbeds of crime, although I'm not sure if this was really true. After their meal, Alice parted from her friends at the corner of Hennepin and Washington, she had decided to go home that night after all, instead of staying with Ida, so her friends saw her onto a southbound streetcar towards Cedar and Camden at 11.06pm. She disembarked at Cedar Avenue and 34th Street and began the familiar walk home, which would only have taken 10 minutes. The rest of the Matthews family spent a relaxing evening listening to music on their phonograph, better known as a gramophone with no idea that their world was about to be cruelly shattered. Most of the family went to bed at about 11, but Henry waited up for his daughter Jenny's return at 1am. 
As Jenny was on her way home, just feet from the house, she brushed against someone in the street and hurried on, assuming it was a drunk sleeping it off. One of the most poignant things about this case is that the Matthews family were completely unaware that their beloved Alice's body lay so close by and Jenny had even walked right past her with no idea that the shape on the ground was her sister. She blamed herself for not mentioning what she had seen and her father said that had he known, he would immediately have rushed to offer help to whoever lay on the ground, even if it was a drunk. But Jenny's guilt was needless as it's very unlikely that Alice would still have been alive at that time. The funeral was held on March the 27th, four days after the murder, and many local people attended the sad ceremony, shocked by the senseless brutality in their neighbourhood. Alice was buried with her mother Mary Blewett, who had died in 1901 in her 30s. All her friends from the mill clubbed together to buy a wreath for the Matthews family, and attended their funeral to pay their respects. The loss was unthinkable, and amidst the despair and heartache, all Alice's family could do was hope for the perpetrator to be caught. Police questioned George Brooks and C. Dablin, two conductors on the streetcar Alice had travelled on the night of her death. Both remembered Alice, but they didn't notice anyone following her or getting off at the same stop. Police also interviewed her friends, but although they helped piece together the events of the evening, they learned nothing that could help them find a possible motive. The public soon became aware that law enforcement had made a terrible mistake when they were called by the concerned Tibbetts family on the night of the murder, not once, but twice. On the first occasion, a motorcycle officer was sent to 35th and 20th Avenue but he couldn't find anybody lying in the street as described, so he went away. This was the person the Tibbets had seen, but because it was dark and they weren't sure if he was a police officer or not, they were understandably scared to leave the safety of the house to speak to him. Then after the second call, the decision was made not to bother sending anyone, despite promising that a horseback officer would be dispatched. It was Lieutenant Johnson from the 6th Precinct, Minnehaha Station who answered both calls. He claimed that an exact address wasn't given and there was no mention of a woman's scream but Mrs Tibbet and her daughter were adamant they'd told him about that and that they gave their full address on the second call. The mayor was furious with Johnson and offered a $500 reward from his own funds for any information leading to the killer's arrest. Now under intense scrutiny Police canvassed all the homes in the area and questioned anyone with facial wounds living nearby, but there wasn't enough evidence to hold any of them. Suspects included Benny Brock, who had scratches on his face, and farmhand George Milonsky, who had a cut on his hand and attracted suspicion by hiding whenever he saw anyone coming. Even the Matthews family's next door neighbour was arrested and held for five days before the grand jury demanded his release and criticised police for holding him based on a flimsy tip from an unreliable witness. Other troubling stories began to surface. There were reports of strange men walking around at night and neighbours of the Matthews family said that a few weeks ago, Alice's sister Jenny and two friends were chased down the street by a drunken man. They recognised him as someone living in the area and police questioned him, but didn't think the incident was significant. It's testament to the uneasy feeling in the city that an article appeared in the papers around this time about ladies learning the art of jiu-jitsu and self-defence techniques with umbrellas. A woman named Ethel Manning claimed she'd been approached by a black man near the Matthews house a few days before the murder, and several more times since, but it later became clear that all he had done was try to make conversation. Thanks to the inherent racism of the time, Mrs Manning assumed he was a threat. She also asserted that she'd seen him on the night of the murder, riding in the same streetcar as Alice. She told the Minneapolis Tribune, Miss Matthews sat across from me on the right side. She was alone when I first noticed her, 
a man of dark complexion was seated on the same side of the car with me. Suddenly, he said to me, Pleasant weather, isn't it? It tells us a lot about the time period that she felt it necessary to comment on the colour of her fellow passenger's skin and consider it odd that he would dare to strike up a conversation with her about the weather. She went on to explain that he made further attempts to talk to her and that he moved to sit closer to Alice Matthews. Mrs Manning described the man's appearance. He was wearing a dark suit with a light grey overcoat, a derby hat, and had crinkly hair. He had a half-moon scar on the right side of his face, from the corner of his eye to the ridge of his nose. I got off at 33rd Street, so I saw neither Alice nor the man disembarking. Curiously, the conductors didn't remember seeing a man matching Mrs Manning's description. Another passenger, Evelyn Anderson, said the only other people riding that night were a man and a woman who got off at 34th Street with Alice around 11.30pm. She was sure nobody had sat next to the victim. This would suggest that the killer attacked at some point on her journey on foot. This might be backed up by a report from a man named Albert Savage who claimed to have got off at the same stop as Alice. He said that nobody else got off, but as she was walking, a man was following her about three feet behind, seeming to have an argument with her. They stopped at the place where her body was later found and continued their disagreement, at which point Savage passed by. But his story didn't ring true. Firstly, he said he'd arrived home at 11.30pm, but it was proven to be 11.30 already when Alice disembarked. Second, Although the other passengers recounted different details of the ride, they both agreed on one point. They never mentioned Savage being there. Two days after the murder, Savage found two gold cuff buttons lying on the ground at the crime scene and handed them into police. It might seem surprising that the police had missed these, but a Minnesota Tribune reporter scoured the area later with the help of a local man and found a hairpin and part of a feather from Alice's hat, along with a fragment of red cloth and a man's collar button. It's unclear whether all these items came from the struggle, or whether any of them had been dropped at an earlier time, but it does call into question how thoroughly the police searched. It soon became apparent that Savage was mistaken about the events of that night, as it was proven he'd been on the 1114 streetcar, the one after Alice's 1106, This means he would have arrived at his stop a few minutes later than 11.30, which implies he would have stumbled across the body on his way home, or even the murder in progress. So either he was lying about his route home, and never passed the area at all, or he did pass by and saw the body but ignored it, or Alice took a detour and was somewhere else when Savage walked past, and the murder happened shortly afterwards. Neighbour Mrs Thomas reported hearing the screams just after 11.30, but a few days later she changed her story and said it was closer to 11.45, which seems more feasible. So if any part of Savage's story was true, he'd been in the area very close to the time of the murder. Soon he had another story to tell. This time he reported seeing two couples on 20th Avenue on his way home that night. The first were identified as a brother and sister, and could have been the man and woman that Evelyn Anderson saw on the streetcar. The second pair was apparently in front of Mrs Thomas's house, and the man was pushing the woman back against the embankment, but he couldn't describe either of them. Reports were conflicting, and it was soon stated that Alice was wearing gloves when she was found, although the first report noted she had broken nails. If the glove story were true, it would mean the killer was less likely to have scratches on his face and arms than first suspected. Either way, the longer the search went on, the less visible any defensive wounds would be. Police were lambasted for their lack of progress and newspapers went to town, enthusiastically printing a flurry of reports about young women being chased and accosted around the city. One woman, Mrs Lyons, was even attacked in her own home by an unidentified man, but fortunately escaped unharmed. More suspects emerged, 
bloody clothes were found near Fort Snelling, so a deserter was sought for questioning. Three boys declared they'd spotted a man with scratches on his face hanging around the railroad yard near Hennepin Avenue, and there was a rumour that he was hiding in a boxcar. An angry mob steamed their way there, preparing to lynch the man if they found him, but the story turned out to be untrue. There was nobody hiding, and the city was thankfully spared the spilling of blood by vigilantes. An intriguing report in the Tribune noted that a man with scratches on his face handed himself into police and asked them to officially confirm his explanation about being in a fight a few days before, as his injuries were making him the object of suspicion everywhere he went. No doubt he wished to avoid a similar situation to the man in the boxcar, if he ever existed. The police checked the details and cleared him. At one point, detectives considered that whoever was responsible for viciously choking Alice Matthews to death might also have killed Evelyn Henson, who was shot dead on 33rd Avenue South the year before, a crime that was still unsolved. They also began to suspect that Alice's murderer was the same felon who'd been chasing and stalking women through the streets, and that this reprobate was a Jekyll and Hyde character, a model citizen by day, a maniac by night. Eventually, despite the efforts of the 15 detectives on the case, the investigation had nowhere else to go. There were plenty of clues leading up blind alleys, like discarded men's clothes found near the crime scene, which transpired to belong to a drunk, completely unconnected with the case. Even with a further $1,000 reward being offered, no useful leads materialised. Less than a month after Alice's death, the press had another tragedy to report. The sinking of the Titanic, along with over 1,500 of its passengers, including 71 Americans. The appalling death of Alice Matthews might have slipped into the history books with no further inkling as to the identity of her murderer, but over a year and a half later, someone came forward and confessed to the crime. On October the 14th, 1913, 19-year-old Alfred Harvey Driscoll was arrested in Chicago for vagrancy and told police he'd killed Alice Matthews in Minneapolis in June 1912, although this date was incorrect as the murder was in March. Detectives contacted Minneapolis police, who were far from convinced. They'd already discounted Driscoll as a suspect at the time of the murder, as it turned out he confessed once before already, but he'd been detained and released so quickly it had never made it to the papers. Chief of Police Martinson told reporters, The Minneapolis police will take no action in regard to the so-called Driscoll confession. We know the story he told the Chicago police, every word of it, and we have investigated every angle of it that would throw some light on the murder. All our investigations led us more firmly to believe that his obsession was the workings of a distorted mind. He finally admitted to Detective Hansen that there was no truth in his story, but we continued the investigation until we were absolutely sure he knew nothing of the murder. Driscoll had been at home in bed at the time of the homicide, in his mother's house. His history revealed an assortment of mental health concerns. He had been discharged from the army due to cocaine addiction, and had spent time in a reformatory for theft, but when he was released on parole, he found that the freedom he had longed for wasn't all it was cracked up to be. He struggled to cope alone and suffered from depression, so he asked to be readmitted to the reformatory. They kept him for a short time, but then asked him to leave, so maybe his confession came from a desperation to be institutionalised again, which isn't uncommon among prisoners. Just two days later, Driscoll admitted to fabricating the confession. He told a reporter in Chicago he'd been looking for work in the city with his father, but as jobs weren't easy to come by, he planned to go back home to his mother in Minneapolis. As he had no money and couldn't afford to travel back there, he decided to trick the police into taking him. He didn't get his wish as Chief Martinson of Minneapolis instructed Chicago police to release him. Everything went quiet for another 18 months or so, 
but with this case it seemed that the same old people kept cropping up over and over. At first it was Albert Savage, and now it was Driscoll. Now living in Arkansas using the name James Wilson, Driscoll confessed to the murder of Alice Matthews once again, giving himself up to the city marshal in June 1915, over three years after the crime took place. A reporter spoke to his mother, who said, Has Alfred confessed again? Why, you know, he isn't right mentally. He left here two years ago to join the army. I heard from him in April, and he was in Panama. I know that he was home on the night that the Matthews girl was killed. It was months after the murder that he first confessed. I think he probably wants someone to bring him back to Minneapolis, where he could easily clear himself and be very near home. Police still didn't believe him. He also claimed to have been part of a gang of bandits who had buried $20,000 worth of jewels in the city of New Brighton. So his delusions didn't stop at the murder of Alice Matthews. Minneapolis police wired Arkansas and told them to release Driscoll. They were still convinced of his innocence. He somehow made his way back to his hometown and continued to declare his guilt. Minneapolis PD was sick of the sight of him by now and refused to entertain his fantastic tales. Driscoll's next move was to write to the Tribune newspaper, tempting them with the promise that he knew who Alice's killer was. He arranged to meet a reporter at the theatre, agreeing to tell them everything if they gave him a free ticket to that night's show and dinner. The Tribune wisely took the letter straight to the police. Driscoll was sent his theatre ticket, but it was Detective Gleason who met him there in the guise of a reporter. I can only assume Gleason didn't recognise him, or his heart would have sunk at seeing the troublesome confessor once again, and he might have walked away, but he listened to the man's story and took it seriously enough to escort him to the police station, where he was interrogated for two hours. This time, none of the officers involved had ever met him before. As to whether he got to see his show and eat his dinner, or whether he was taken to the station immediately, I'm not sure. Driscoll's confession was troubling, told through tears and evident turmoil. I was at home in New Brighton. My mother and stepfather went to bed around 8 o'clock. I went to bed too. At 9.30 I got up. I couldn't sleep. I wanted to see a girl in Minneapolis. I crawled out the window, walked to Central Avenue Road, and was downtown about 10.30. I knew Alice Matthews. I had met her with another girl and a man at the Kaiserhof about three months before. I had been out with her several times to theaters. I saw her that night in front of the Metropolitan Theater. We walked down towards the bridge square and then got on a Cedar and 38th Street car. I was not dressed very well, so I didn't sit with her on the car. She got off at Longfellow Avenue. I got off at the next block, 19th Avenue. I walked back and we met. She was a little ashamed of my looks, and that's when we got off at different places. We sat down on a vacant lot near the corner of Longfellow and 38th Street. His story doesn't sound viable, as Alice's close friends were insistent that she didn't associate with men. Mr. Matthews confirmed this too, and he'd made it clear that his daughter was welcome to invite any boyfriends to their home. So it seems that the family was open and accepting, and as she was 21, there's no obvious reason why she would conceal a relationship. Alice's uncle, a foreman at the mill where she worked, also agreed, stating that she seemed not to care about the company of men and always went around with her girlfriends. An article in the Minneapolis Star reported that she had many admirers, but it was printed many years after the fact and there's no evidence for this at all. Driscoll continued his confession. I was infatuated with the girl. I asked her to marry me. She refused, and we argued for some time. I had a revolver in my pocket. I told her I would commit suicide. She asked me not to do that, but she wouldn't marry me. Then something snapped in my mind and choked her. I remember seeing her lying on the grass. I realized I had killed her, but don't remember exactly what I did. I don't know what else happened. 
Police Chief Martinson kept him under arrest this time, but suspected that Driscoll was mentally ill. Police escorted the suspect to the murder site, and he pointed out where Alice had got off the streetcar, then where he had got off, and then the spot where they had allegedly sat down together, just 20 feet from where her body was later found. Driscoll noted that there was a cement sidewalk there now, which hadn't been there at the time. This was verified to be true, but plenty of people in the area would have known this, so it doesn't mean he really was the killer. Next, he was taken to the Matthews family home, but Alice's stepmother looked at him and said she didn't think he'd killed Alice, although she couldn't say why. But he'd given enough detail and pointed out the murder site accurately, so police decided to have Driscoll's mental health assessed in case he was insane and had simply convinced himself of his guilt. Three psychiatrists, doctors Quimby, Crafts and Foote, examined Driscoll. To them, he said that he hadn't felt very guilty after the murder, had felt no worse than if he had killed a pet rabbit. He claimed he didn't know Alice was dead until several weeks later, when he read about it in the paper. He said he knew he wasn't right mentally, and had confessed because he wanted to go to an asylum. The three doctors spoke to his mother and learned that his father had been a thief and a heavy drinker and had split when Driscoll was nine. She believed the reason her son was so desperate to be locked up was because he had got caught up in a secret society and felt that being institutionalised was his only escape. She was still certain that he had been home on the night of the murder. Quimby, Crafts and Foote pointed out that Driscoll had got his timings muddled and failed to remember all the details from his latest confession. He couldn't recall what Alice was wearing on the night of her death and most worryingly of all, he believed he was a descendant of King Alfred the Great. Perhaps unsurprisingly, they found Driscoll to be insane and suffering from monomania, an exaggerated or obsessive preoccupation with one thing. They were convinced he wasn't a murderer, but were suffering from the delusion that he was. He wasn't ill enough to be admitted to an asylum, so there was no choice but to release him. However, Dr Foote admitted that monomania was difficult to detect, and the examination only lasted for an hour, so how could they have decided so quickly? No doubt the Minneapolis police were relieved to be rid of Driscoll, but it wouldn't be for the final time. Yes, believe it or not, He sprung up once again in August 1920, more than eight years after Alice's death. Police received a report of a man being assaulted by three hooligans at 54th Street and Central Avenue Northeast. They had hidden behind a tree, pounced on their victim and held him down while they poured lye over his feet. Lye is sodium hydroxide and has various uses, including making biodiesel, and clearing blocked drains. It's also used for making soap, but the processing method ensures none is left in the finished product, which is just as well, because it can cause severe burns, which is exactly what happened to this victim's feet. The victim turned out to be none other than Alfred Driscoll, now 26 years old. He soon conceded that he'd invented the escapade and had poured lye over his own feet. At first it was thought that he'd done it to seek sympathy from a young woman he'd been seeing, but he explained he was really hoping to get financial support from his father in Illinois. It didn't work. The hospital contacted Mr Driscoll Sr, who explained that neither he nor Alfred's mother had seen him in years, and he had a track record of running away and disappearing, only turning up when he needed help. But his father had no money to give him, and could only hope that his son recovered and managed to make his own way home in due course. It was weeks before Alfred Driscoll was released from hospital, which in a way is the kind of institutionalisation he'd probably hoped for. I don't know if he was involved in any further incidents during the rest of his life, but he went through two marriages and two divorces, had one child and died aged 73. Other suspects came out of the woodwork from time to time, as the years passed, like Oscar Lindgren, who worked at a steel and machinery plant. He was suspected in the 1920 murder 
of Dorothy Bowers, who'd been bludgeoned with a rock. She had fought for her life, and her clothes were torn, and newspapers highlighted the parallels with Alice's case eight years earlier. In 1919, Lindgren was accused of the murder of 17-year-old Madeline LeCount, at whose Lake Minnetonka home he was working as a gardener when she was beaten to death. Although he was acquitted, many might wonder, given what happened three years later in 1922. He pled guilty to the assault of a 21-year-old knitting mill employee who was beaten unconscious on her way home from work. Lindgren slipped on the ice while making his escape and was caught and sentenced to 10 to 20 years. Apparently he'd used a ruse to gain her trust, approaching her to ask for directions before launching the vicious assault. In court he admitted that he was suddenly gripped with an overwhelming urge to beat a woman. Is it possible that Lindgren killed Alice Matthews? She was strangled and choked, a method of killing which takes a lot of strength and time, and she had put up a fight, so it's possible he learned and adapted, deciding to use a baseball bat for the 1919 murder and a rock in 1920. In my very first episode I talked about Agortsov, a serial killer in Nazi Germany, who evolved in a similar way, learning from his early crimes where his victims survived, and adapting to use an iron bar to incapacitate them quickly. Lindgren was certainly guilty of at least one vicious attack, but as he was acquitted of the others, we have no evidence to suggest he was involved. Alice Matthews has never had justice, and the case has slipped into obscurity. Was Alfred Driscoll telling the truth with his multiple confessions, or was he just a mentally unwell young man? and the real murderer was someone never even on the radar. Should Savage have been investigated more thoroughly, given his keenness to insert himself into the investigation? The police department's failure to attend the scene on the night of Alice's death, and their cursory search of the area, with members of the public finding scraps of evidence the police didn't, makes me wonder. Had the investigation been more competently handled, could this have ended differently? Over a century has passed, so we have no way of knowing, and the case remains unsolved, and no matter who murdered Alice, her family had to live with the grief and heartbreak for the rest of their lives. Thank you for listening to Prasha's Murder Map. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. I'd love to hear from you with any comments or suggestions, so get in touch via Twitter at Prasha's Murder Map, visit www.prashersmurdermap.com or simply do things the old-fashioned way and email me at prashersmurdermap at gmail.com Next time, we'll be flying across the world to a country we've never been to in this show before. We'll be exploring the cryptic murder of 13-year-old schoolgirl Tahir Rada in Israel, who went to the bathroom and never came back. Is the man serving time in jail really guilty? Or is there more to this story? Until then, take care everyone. They murdered her. A vile and disgraceful act. We were able to discover the remains of two humans. Welcome to Crime Lapse. I am Eileen. And I'm Charlie. Crime Lapse is a true crime podcast that uses primary audio, in-depth research and emotive narration to give you an immersive insight into the darkest tales and most horrifying crimes. Find Crime Lapse wherever you listen to podcasts and at Crime Lapse Podcast or at Crime Lapse Pod on social media. Everyone has a story to tell, so why not let us tell you some? Hey there, true crime friends. It's Melanie Peterson, the host of Mask of Sanity. Join me as I take you through the cases of some of the world's most notorious killers and the brave men and women who risked it all to capture them. You can find Mask of Sanity wherever you listen to podcasts and hear all about the calculated madness of some of the world's most brutal killers who hid behind the Mask of Sanity. You won't want to miss this. Until next time, stay safe, friends.